After high school many years ago, I was in a bad place. My guardian had kicked me out after graduation. She didn't help me find a place to stay, so I lived in my car for a couple of months. I met some heavy metal dudes at work one day. I'd seen them around town and all my other friends knew who they were. Everyone loved them. We became friends over a couple of months and they offered for me to move in with them. I agreed. Looking back now, I wish I had just stayed in my car. My two main roommates were brothers named Andrew and Seth. They were in a band. They also believed in the occult and anything of that sort. I never really believed in that stuff, but I'm not one to tell someone what they should believe. They had let me live with them rent-free for several months, so who was I to complain? Being the only female in a house full of young men, I was always looking over my shoulder. You never know who you can trust. And turns out, I was right to worry. Over time, their friends started to stay with us for longer periods of time, sometimes weeks. Their friends were another group of brothers that they had gone to school with. There were five brothers in total, but only two stayed with us consistently. The younger brother, Mark, was very polite. He cleaned up after himself and always helped with the household chores. The other brother, Adam, had a laundry list of mental problems. He'd apparently done some bad drugs back in the day and it had developed into what seemed like psychosis of the religious sort. He had done time in prison for assaulting a woman with a Bible. He would often look you in the eyes and tell you he could see how you would die. Once, he told me that I was possessed by a demon and I needed my soul cleansed. Everyone in the house knew he had these problems, but he was their friend. They helped him through the hard times and gave him a place to stay. Otherwise, he would be on the streets. I was always on guard around him after the things he told me. No one else seemed to be as concerned as I was. They should have been. One day, I was sleeping and my phone rang. It was my boss. He asked if I could come into work an hour early. It was only 12 p.m. I was broke and had nothing better to do, so I said yes. I got up and began getting ready to leave. I walked out into the living room to see Mark and Andrew sitting on the couch while Adam sat on the floor by the TV. He was watching scripture videos on YouTube, some real end of day stuff. That was fairly common, so I went about my business. I said goodbye and left for work. My shift at work was almost complete when the phone rang. My boss answered, handed the phone to me and said, It's for you. I was just a cashier, so I assumed it was a friend that couldn't reach me on my phone. I answered the phone and heard a man's voice that I didn't recognize. Hi, this is Detective Williams. Something happened at your apartment today and we need you to come into the station to talk to you about it. I left work immediately. I had assumed one of the brothers had been arrested for drug dealing or something. I was very wrong. I got to the station and was buzzed in. An officer escorted me to a small cold room with a camera. He gave me a bottle of water and left me by myself for about 30 minutes. My mind was racing, thinking about what could have happened. He came back in and informed me that Adam had stabbed and killed Andrew at around 1 p.m. I was shocked. I had just left the house an hour before it happened and everything seemed fine. I asked if there had been a fight. The detective informed me that there hadn't been a fight and it seemed to have happened out of nowhere. I gave my statement to the police and left with nowhere to go still in shock and confused out of my mind. Our apartment was a crime scene, so I went to another friend's house to watch the news report since the police wouldn't give me any information on the case. Over the next couple of days, the information began to be released. Adam hadn't just stabbed Andrew once, not twice, but he had stabbed him over and over and nearly decapitated him. After the murder, he ran down the road still holding the murder weapon. He called 911 and informed them what he had done. I watched the news report in horror. We had known he was unstable, but this? He had fully confessed to the brutal murder and provided police with his notebooks. He had apparently been planning to murder all of his brothers, my roommates, and me. He thought we were possessed by demons and this was the only way to free us. Luckily, none of his other intended victims were there that day. Mark unfortunately witnessed the murder, but he luckily escaped. 
If I hadn't gotten that call from my boss, I wouldn't be alive today. This happened a few years ago when I was bartending at college. I was coming home down a stretch of divided highway at around 3am when I noticed a car heading towards me in the wrong lane. I doubted myself at first and thought the car was on the other side of the highway. Sure enough, the white Ford sedan passed me at a really high speed, at least 90 miles per hour. It's worth noting for later that I also drive a white Ford sedan. I was used to drunk idiot drivers in the middle of the night so I pulled to the side of the road and let him pass me. I had a moment of clarity and thought to call the police, thinking this person could hurt themselves or somebody else. The dispatcher answered and after telling them which road and exit and mile marker I was at, told me they would send a car. The state police station was only a few exits away so I figured that they would send somebody and I would just drive home. As I headed back onto the highway, I noticed some lights a few miles behind me. I live in a more rural part of southeastern PA and traffic at 3am tends to be truckers and cops. The car gained on me as I was getting up to speed so I stayed in the right lane and waited to be passed. Instead, they flipped on their high beams making it uncomfortable to drive and rode my tailgate. At this point, I thought I was going to be pulled over by the police. I drove a white Ford sedan and had just called about a different white Ford sedan so I grabbed my registration from my glove box. Suddenly, the car behind me audibly slammed on the brakes and stopped in the middle of the highway. They must have shot off their car because the lights went out and I saw what looked like the same Ford sedan from earlier. Still, I thought this may have been a police car, they had a roof rack and it could have looked like I had reached for a gun in my glove box or something. I panicked and called 911 for the second time and asked the dispatcher if they had sent a cruiser to investigate. The dispatcher was a little curt with me and assured me that they sent somebody out. We sent a trooper out to find the car, sir. Listen, I only ask because somebody's following me and acting weird. It could be a cop and I think I freaked them out by getting my registration. Are you pulled over? No, they didn't turn on their lights. Let me try to get the trooper we sent out. As she was talking, the car again sped towards me and stopped inches from the bumper. Again, their high beams were on and again they slammed the brakes. I told the dispatcher, I'm pretty sure this is not the police behind me. The car sped to my bumper again and turned their high beams on, this time laying on the horn. Hearing this, the dispatcher asked me what was happening. What's happening? Did you honk? That's the car behind me. I don't think it's a cop. I'll try to get the trooper again, but I don't think that's him behind you, sir. For some reason, this is what shook me. Before that, I was thinking I would get pulled over and maybe get a ticket. Up until then, I was going the speed limit and trying to avoid getting pulled over. I told the dispatcher, I don't care if I get pulled over. I'm speeding, and if they put their lights on, then I'll pull over. I started to accelerate and the person behind me just kept up with me. The speed limit was 55 and they kept on my bumper the entire time but this time they were swerving. I tried to signal for an exit then bail on it but they followed. At the next exit I took the off ramp and continued on to the on ramp and the car behind me followed the whole time. I thought about trying to go to a Wawa, which is a convenience store gas station that's pretty much the only populated place in southeastern PA at 3 a.m., but the dispatcher and I thought that would be unsafe. She was calm and talking to another person trying to send police to me. The other person, maybe a supervisor, asked if I could drive to the state police station. Realizing that I was only one exit away, I told her I was coming there and she said that she would have troopers meet me outside. As I pulled off to the exit, the car followed me. I blew a few red lights trying to get to the police station and the car tried to pull into the other lane to pass me or pull up alongside me. Once the police station was in view, I put on my turn signal and the car slammed on its brakes again, turned off their lights, and turned into a parking lot. The story ends kind of anticlimactically as I pulled into the police station and met the troopers. Two of them went to find the car and I stayed with the third trooper. 
I thanked the dispatcher and her supervisor and the state trooper escorted me home after taking a statement from me. I was never called to follow up or testify, so I can only assume the person hasn't been caught. This happened 24 years ago in July of 1996. I had finished my term of service for the army. I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, and decided at midnight I would outprocess and travel back to Wisconsin. All day I was so anxious to go that I had trouble sleeping. Finally, at 2345, I got out of bed and went to sign out with the desk sergeant. Of course, knowing people wanted to sign out at midnight, he decided to do his rounds. You can't leave until you get your final sign-off with the sergeant and turn in your room key. So I waited and waited and finally at 02.45 he returned. I turned my key in, got the sign-off, and at 03.30 I was on my way. At first I was so full of adrenaline that I felt that I could drive for days. Unfortunately that adrenaline didn't last long and by the time I was getting through Dallas I was nodding off. I decided just past Denton that I would pull over at the next rest stop and take a quick nap until the sun came up. I could barely keep my eyes open when I came up to a stop. I pulled over and got out of my car to get some air and throw something away and to get a look at my surroundings. There were only about three other cars and two semi-trucks there. It was a picnic stop and not a rest stop so no restrooms. I threw my trash away and glanced at a poster of a few missing persons but I really didn't pay any attention to it. I went back to my car, which was a basic Geo Metro. No radio, no power windows, no power locks. I cracked the windows and turned on the boombox I had for some tunes and laid down to get some sleep. I was only asleep maybe 5 or 10 minutes when I felt my car shake just slightly. I cracked an eye open and looked and didn't see anything, so I blew it off and went back to sleep. I then heard what sounded like my door handle being pulled and scratched on the door key. I then sat up quickly, but I didn't see anyone there. I looked at all the windows and didn't see anyone, so again I shrugged it off as me being tired and laid back down and turned up the radio. Being a Texas night in July, it was hot, but I was so tired I just laid back down. A few more minutes later, I heard the door handle again and car really shook. I sat up quickly and saw a man standing at the passenger's side looking in. Even though it was hot and humid, he was wearing a red sweatshirt with the hood up and I couldn't see his face. Being young and dumb and just out of the military, I yelled at him asking what the F do you want? He just stared at me like an idiot and I got out of the car. Mind you, I'm only 5'6", but I was livid. He just walked off towards the picnic tables like nothing happened. All the while, I'm yelling at him that if he came back, I'd take him out. I decided I would just drive on from there. I got back in and went on my way. Even though I was so upset, only about 10 miles down the road, I was super tired again. Luckily, about another 10 miles down I-35, there was another picnic stop. Not sure why North Texas doesn't have rest areas, but they don't. I pulled into the second picnic stop and backed into a spot just in case I needed to leave quickly. Not sure why, but there was only one other car there and no semi-trucks. I again locked the doors, cracked the windows, and turned on my boombox. I fell asleep right away and about 30 minutes later I hear a loud thud on my driver's side window. I jumped up and looked around and no one was there. I got out of the car, which was very stupid, but I had my macho military attitude going but no one was around. I assumed it was my nerves from the other stop. I got back into my car, locked the doors again, and closed my eyes. This time I was too amped up to fall asleep, so I laid there with my eyes closed. I felt that someone was looking at me, and I opened my eyes and saw the guy standing there again with the red sweatshirt, hood up. I couldn't see his eyes, but I could see he was smiling at me. I popped up quick and tried to quickly open the door and bump him, being a cheap geo, since the doors were locked, it didn't open. He walked backwards, still staring at me. By the time I got out, he was about 30 feet away, facing me. It was fairly dark, but as I looked him over, he looked really skinny, but was about 6'2", maybe 6'3". 
but I still felt like I could take him with my military experience. He was wearing the red hooded sweatshirt, blue jeans, and green tennis shoes. For some reason, I thought the shoes looked odd. I could see something shine every now and then as he stood there staring at me, and I honestly believe it was a machete. I quickly reached into my back seat and grabbed my baseball bat and started yelling at him to come get some. I'm not really sure why I said that. He started walking towards me and I took a few steps towards him, not really thinking. As I got about five feet away from my car and he was now about fifteen feet from me, a yellow van pulled up quick and parked just off to the side of the road. I finally realized what was happening and I saw two guys also wearing hooded sweatshirts in the van. Before they could get out, I ran back to my car. I had left the keys in the ignition. Since I had backed in, I was able to cut it hard right and peeled my car out of there. I was so lucky, being a manual car, I didn't stall the car because the other two guys were out of the van and the first guy was just about at my car. I jumped back on the interstate and didn't stop until I was about 20 miles into Oklahoma. I stopped for gas and to use the restroom. In the restroom, I noticed that same flyer I barely glanced at at the first picnic stop. It was basically a flyer with several missing persons on it and warning people not to stop for long periods of time at the rest areas. It described a possible suspect as possibly six foot wearing blue jeans, green shoes, and a red hooded sweatshirt. I completely went white. Needless to say, since it was daylight, I drove the rest of the way to Wisconsin wide awake. Not sure why, but I never reported it to the number on the flyer or told anyone about it. But now I live in North Texas and pass those two picnic stops every day on my way to work, and I think about it quite often. I started my first job at Tim Hortons when I was 16 and worked there for many years throughout high school and university. I could possibly add about 10 stories here about inappropriate regulars, but this is one that still really haunts me. I was about 17, 18 at the time and worked at a location that was 10 minutes down the street from my parents' home. A neighbor, Alex, lived roughly eight houses down, started coming in regularly for coffee and small talk with me. Alex was at least... 45 to 50 and it turns out he used to work with my dad and has lived in my neighborhood for years. Nothing about our conversation seemed weird or alarming to me. After a few months of completely normal interactions he found me on Facebook. I accepted because I was young and had no social media boundaries at the time. This is when things started to get weird. He would DM me about things I was posting instead of commenting publicly. He would offer me rides to work or class and would make comments about my hair, makeup, and curves. I found out that he was married and has a son a few years younger than me. I started ignoring his messages and eventually removed him as a friend. When he came in for his coffee after this, he would ask for my number, wouldn't take no for an answer, and just generally made me uncomfortable. I started asking co-workers to serve him. My manager at the time refused to ban him from the store. I also learned that he used to send a past employee flowers and to do the same things to her. Fast forward a few months, Alex seemed to have gotten the hint and stopped asking for me when he came into my place. One evening, I was walking my dog around my subdivision and smoking some Mary J as I did most nights before bed. I walked the same route each night which unfortunately meant I had to pass by his home. On my way back this night, I saw him out of the corner of my eye coming out of his house with a baseball bat. He stood in his front yard for a few minutes and then I could hear him starting to walk behind me and I panicked. I was also high and unsure if I should be alarmed. Was this a time to panic? Some kids in the duplex across the street started banging on the window and making a bunch of noise. I was too scared to even look up at them. My dog started getting agitated and I decided to start running since I was only two minutes from home. I figured I could make it inside and lock the door. Alex must have gotten spooked by the noise and stopped following me. I'm very thankful for those kids who knew that situation didn't look right and tried to warn me. It worries me to think about what would have happened if they didn't. A 
I was living in Tbilisi a few years ago, the capital of the Republic of Georgia, running a kind of legally ambiguous consumer credit operation, when I figured it was time I took a much needed weekend getaway in a nearby small town. The town I settled on is an extremely popular tourist location given its beautiful location along a river, nestled in a deep valley and rife with the ancient churches. With many options for potential guest houses, hotels, and rentals, I decided to not book in advance and to just traipse around until I found something appropriate. I found a very adequate guest house perched on a hill with about a one acre plot. Upon entering the guest house, I was greeted in typical Georgian fashion by an incredibly hospitable woman in her 60s to 90s. Hyperbole, but former Soviet Union is like that aging wise. And her son, who was in his early 30s, who resumed his yard work of filling a large hole he said was a septic tank with a foul lingering smell after a brief introduction. Again, in typical Georgian fashion, the hostess offered me tea, homemade wine, bread, and cheese, all of which were much needed and fantastic. I'm an American, but my family came from Eastern Europe, so I speak Russian as most Georgians do, so we were able to chat a lot. Our conversation progressed from basic get-to-know-you bits to more personal information like whether I am seeing anyone and who I am dating, which does come up in surprising frequency when you meet sweet grandmothers who want you to meet their granddaughters. At the time, I was dating a fellow expat from a Western European country. When I told the hostess that I was seeing someone, she seemed thrilled and asked me to show her a photo. She reacted with an awe and nodded in approval, commenting on her physique in a way that would probably be inappropriate if it wasn't a cute old grandma. I was then pressed by the hostess as to why I didn't invite her and how this isn't what a good boyfriend would do. Put on the spot like this, I lied and said she was very busy with a work project. She wasn't, but would be arriving later in the evening. Didn't ask. The hostess was elated by this news and called over her son and asked me to show the photo of the girl I was seeing. Early in our conversation, it was established that I don't speak in Georgian. The son saw the photo and affirmatively nodded and spoke in Georgian to the hostess briefly and then turned to me with a beaming smile and thumbs up and said in English, Very pretty, you lucky brother. He then in Russian asked if I texted her to invite her. I lied and said I did text her and reiterated that she was arriving in a few hours. It was around 4 p.m. at the time in a beautiful golden hour glow that lit up the surrounding mountains and valley. The son said he will join us and asked if I like cha-cha. Cha-cha is the very strong national liquor of Georgia ranging from 30 to 75% alcohol content and made from distilled grapes. I had become quite the savant of Cha-Cha, and despite some strange feelings about their fixation on the female visitor, I obliged. Cha-Cha is not for the weak-hearted, but I was very used to consuming it at the time. I should have paid more notice to the very intentional placement of the shots he filled for us, but I pushed those misgivings aside and had the shot after a very traditional toast. Around 20 minutes later, I felt exhausted and ill and excused myself to my room, saying I needed a quick nap. Walking to my room, I knew something was amiss. As mentioned in the beginning, I was fronting a questionable business and did have a firearm in my bag and made a mental note to take it and put it under my pillow, but as one can imagine, it isn't easy to remember things even on short term when apparently drugged. Despite failing to collect my weapon, I did close my blinds as the afternoon sun was blaring into the room and I wanted darkness. Passing out at around 4.30 p.m., I awoke to darkness at 4.45 a.m. with a raging headache. My window shades were partially open despite me closing them before passing out. They were open with about two feet of space visible to the outside. My bags were not in the position I left them, and the television was on and on high volume despite me never using it, and the door was only partially closed. I peered out the window and didn't see anything, so I quickly went to my bag, retrieved my firearm and went to the bathroom with the intention of calling my coworkers or a driver to pick me up. I had no self-service and no Wi-Fi despite having perfectly fine reception the day prior. I went back to bed with a weapon under the pillow with zero desire or inclination to fall back asleep. After an hour or so of pretending to be asleep, I saw the sun peer through the window to get a look inside. At this point, I was certain 
it was not my imagination playing tricks on me and that I was in trouble. I came out at around sunrise to find both the hostess and her son sipping tea on the deck and told the hostess that my girlfriend was arriving soon on a bus and that I'd bring her when it arrived. I grabbed my backpack and left my other bag to give the impression I wasn't fleeing. Got service immediately after leaving the property and called a partner to pick me up. Old school businessman who was floating the money I'd run the lending operation with told him the story and he said he would handle it. He did handle it. I still think about the foul-smelling hole the sun was digging. Last guess? Weeks later, I decided that wasn't the place or business for me and applied to law school on the other side of the world. I grew up in a small town with no more than a few stoplights and a few thousand residents in the Great Basin Desert of the western U.S. For those that have never been, you cannot begin to understand just how vast and isolated you can become in my home state. It's a breeding ground for strange people to hide out from the law, keep to themselves, and do whatever it is they want to remain secret. As someone who frequently spends days exploring isolated vast stretches of desert hours away from cell service in some cases, I unfortunately have a few stories where I was held at gunpoint or thought I was going to be taken, but those for another time. This is my earliest encounter with someone I wish I never met. The valley where this story takes place is where they found a family murdered just a few months prior to my encounter. I didn't know this at the time, and while probably not connected, it gives you a feel for what happens in the desert. I was roughly 12 at the time, 22 male now, and was with my mom and three younger brothers. My dad and uncle were prospecting for gold, and we got bored, and so we thought we'd go hike into the valley to an abandoned miner's shack probably two miles away. No biggie, we've done this many times to pass the time, and it's cool to see the old ruins. Note, my dad and uncle had the pistols, but we didn't. We get down there with no issues and the shack looks clearly abandoned and in disrepair. It looks to be from the 1930s and is kind of resting on a small hill with a dirt road leading to it. We go inside to explore and all is good, till I see on one of the old shelves brand new canned goods, fresh paper wrappers and all. I thought to myself that this was odd, but... Figured some backpackers must have left them for the next guy. Boy, was I wrong. We keep exploring this house until I come into a room and see something that I will forever remember. That feeling you get when you instantly know something is horribly wrong, that struck me hard. That room had a fresh house cat hung from the rafters of the ceiling with its abdomen split open, intestines hanging out. It had to have only been a few days old. I never let my mom or brothers see it, I just ran to the room that they were in and said we had to go, now. I just said I had a bad feeling because of those cans. We get out of the house and we're about 50 feet away when my brother insists he needs to go to the bathroom. I didn't tell them what I saw because I knew it had freaked them out and he just had to go, so here we are. A baseball throws away from this house and my brother's going to the bathroom. Just as he finishes... From the back side of the hill the shack is on comes an old white beat up van and I remember thinking this is it, I'll never see my dad again. They'll never know what happened to us. But out of the van I remember vividly seeing four men step out and look in our general direction. I picked up my youngest brother and my mom and the other two brothers and we all took off running. I've never felt more scared in my life. I didn't dare look back to see if they were trailing after us. I couldn't make myself. After what feels like forever, we finally get out of the valley and meet up with my dad and uncle. We tell them our story and we get out of there. To this day, I still can't help but wonder if I'd be alive today had I not seen the dead cat before those guys got to the shack. Let's call her Sam. All throughout high school and even a bit afterwards, we were best friends. Even though we were best friends, I felt like I didn't really know her, if that makes sense. 
We were pretty wild teenagers, drinking, smoking, hanging out with older guys. Ew, I know. Sam always dated super sketchy guys. When we were 16, Sam started dating a 27-year-old named John. I had my fair share of dating guys way too old for me as well, though, so I didn't see anything wrong with it. Also, predators have a special way of making you feel like there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. I have a fair share of trauma due to older men from that time in my life, but that's a story for another time. She didn't have a car at the time, so she would regularly ask me to drop her off at his place to hang out and cover for her if her mom contacted me, because this relationship was obviously hidden from her mom. Being an idiot teenager, I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. She's my homegirl, and I know she'd do the same for me. Plus, I'd met John several times before, and he seemed decent enough at the time. Please keep in mind that I was also a teenager at the time, and obviously I realize that he's a predator now. He would give us alcohol and stuff and would invite us over to the party with his equally disgusting friends. Their relationship seemed fine at first, but it turned toxic within a few months. I mean, duh, he was a grown man manipulating a little girl. He would constantly demand to track her phone location and control what she wore. He also cheated on her multiple times, but she always stayed. During the time this happened, I stopped driving her to see him. One time, she called me begging me to drive her to see him, and I said no. She went on to explain that he was drunk, and if I wouldn't, then he would pick her up, and if they got into a crash due to drunk driving, it would be my fault. So, I drove her to his house. I was furious with John at this point for hurting my best friend and had a rebellious teenage give-no-f's attitude, so as soon as I walked into his house to drop Sam off, I started screaming at him for being manipulative. His response, and the dark, twisted yet emotionless look in his eyes, still gives me chills to this day. I could break your neck so easily. Thankfully, I was standing right by the front door, so I ran out to my car and immediately sped off. The next couple of years are kind of fuzzy. Also, I asked Sam to stop talking to me about John because I was sick of hearing about him, but basically they were constantly breaking up and getting back together. Sam dated a string of other guys, but would always cheat on them with John. When we were 18, this is when things started getting progressively weirder and I started to distance myself from Sam because of it. Long story short, Sam had a new boyfriend who she seemed crazy about, and I was so relieved because she finally seemed over John. Then, she heard through the grapevine that John got engaged, and she became irate. We were hanging out when she heard the news, and she was like, I just have to go home and process this. So she immediately left and I was like, whatever, I'll give her her space. She calls me a few hours later and was talking super fast and laughing a lot. I was like, you good? And she responds, yeah, I just broke into John's apartment and smashed all of his stuff. I know that I have this new guy I'm dating, but I've been hooking up with John still. Don't hate me and I'm sorry I didn't tell you. But anyway, I feel so great. I broke his TV and cut up all of his sheets. Too bad John and his fiancée weren't home. I had never seen her act like this before and was so alarmed. What would she have done if they were home? The break-ins was never reported to the police because she told John it was her. And if he went to the police, John's fiancée would likely have found out that he was cheating on her with Sam. Now... At this point, a smart person would completely cut her off, but I didn't. I stopped hanging out with her as much and we naturally grew a bit distant because I had moved across the country for college, but we would text and FaceTime every couple of weeks. In 2018, John's fiance was found dead. The police immediately ruled it that she ended her own life because there was a note and the gun was found in her hand, but all of her friends and family insisted that she would never do that. I knew this because I had a few mutual friends with his fiance, and it was understandably all that anyone could talk about. She was known to everyone as being extremely positive and cheerful. They pressured the cops to investigate more and lo and behold, one year later, John was found guilty of murdering her. He is currently in prison and it chills me to the bone knowing that I was in his house on multiple occasions and used to frequently hang out with him. So now moving on to why I think my friend may have had something to do with it. 
Last year, she was visiting my city and asked to meet up for dinner. I was like, sure, why not? We're going to be in public and I do miss her and it'd be nice to catch up. While we were at dinner, she had her phone on the table and I saw a call from the name Jail ringing in her phone. She quickly excused herself to take the call and was gone for a couple of minutes. When she got back, I was like, what was that about? She explained that she visits John in prison regularly and they talk on the phone every day. I was like, why? He was found guilty of murder. Why would you want anything to do with that guy? And she looked me dead in the eyes, with a look of pure evil and malice and said, I'm the only one who knows what actually happened. Nobody else knows the truth. I quickly changed the subject and finished my dinner really quickly and made an excuse to leave. I was terrified at this point and had no idea what she was capable of. I hightailed it back to my apartment and blocked her on everything, and I haven't spoken to her since. I know this isn't solid proof that she was involved, but her past behavior, the break-in, coupled with that chilling comment and the fact that she regularly visited a convicted murderer in prison leads me to believe she had something to do with it. At the very least, she knows much more than she's leading on. This happened this time last year, and to this day, every time I think about it, it gives me chills. So I want to start off by saying I still work for this company, and I still have anxiety every time I go into work. The company is huge, one of the biggest names in the world. For privacy purposes, I'm going to call it the Big Cheese, or Big C. I also want to mention that I have crippling social anxiety. I credit to being homeschooled most of my life. This will make more sense later. Well, September of last year, I was fresh out of high school and looking for work. I needed this job immediately because I was living with my significant other, and we were barely getting by. My father, my grandfather, they both either work or worked for this company for a long period of time, and it is something that garnered a lot of respect in my family. So, of course, I was thrilled when I got my first interview. It went great and I was all set to start training, which involved a few classes and on-the-job training. The classes were awkward to say the least, but nonetheless informative. Well, after the classes, we had our first task. Join a group of fellow trainees and tour the work environment. This is when I met creepy co-worker. He was in the very back of my group, seemed a little shy, and didn't really talk to the rest of the group unless he was trying to make an awkward joke to the join in. At first, I kind of felt bad for him. He seemed harmless, but definitely awkward, and out of the loop. Knowing as much as I did going into the company, I made the effort to inform him and keep him updated with what the trainers were asking of us. He just seemed so lost and confused. I thought I was doing good thing by helping him out. Even my significant other thought so at the time, the training went by without any hiccups, and as soon as we were given the location of where we'd start out, ironically enough, the only person that I had gotten to know was Creepy Coworker, and he had the same area I did. Realizing that we'd start out together, we both didn't know anyone, we decided to exchange our phone numbers. This was so that we could both meet up at the next week, starting day, so we wouldn't get lost. I thought nothing of this when he asked for my number and just assumed it was more because he was nervous and didn't know anyone besides me. Boy, did I live to regret that. The first day of training we met up at basically a flagpole, so we could wait for our on-the-job trainer, Christy. When we got off the employee shuttle, he started texting me asking me where I was. I was in the smoking section a little ways away, killing my fears with a cigarette. I texted him back, where I was and asked if he could join. I didn't like how nervous I felt so I wasn't very comfortable with anyone joining me during this time of reprieve, but I saw him coming over anyways, so I scooted over to make room on the bench. This didn't matter because apparently he was going to sit as close as possible to me anyways. I hate touch, or people being in my personal bubble. Being a victim of other trauma, Touch was something only people very close to me have permission to do. 
creepy coworker then proceeds to ask me if he could bum a cigarette. And I'm not good at saying no, so I give him one. After he lit up, he handed me the lighter. That I didn't even notice he took from my top of my bag. Back to me again. I kind of just ignored the unwarranted invasion of my space. We talked since we had about 30 minutes to kill. We talked about the normal stuff like, how do you feel about the company? Where do you want to end up in it? I noticed he was wearing tattoo covering sleeves, and so I asked him about his tattoos. He pulled down the sleeves and started going over almost each and every one. All something to do with either a love interest or something geeky. I listened out of mind curiosity, but I quickly got uncomfortable when he started pulling out his phone to show me pictures of ones he drew. I was always uncomfortable because he kept showing me pictures of himself as well, mostly photos of him shirtless, and I didn't really find that appropriate. He mentioned he was a marine and that he had gained too much weight after his last tour. I apologized out of sympathy but suggested that it was nothing to be ashamed of. Unfortunately, after that, he kept smiling at me in a way I deemed to be admiration. I had seen this look from my fiancé so I knew somewhere I had effed up. I quickly turned the conversation to a more appropriate stuff like music taste. He seemed interested in what music I like a little too much, and decided he would make me a playlist. I said it really wasn't necessary, but he insisted. Later into that very day during training, he kept purposely doing kind things like taking heavy boxes from my hands, or taking the odd jobs he deemed too grueling for a lady. I was a little annoyed, but mostly just glad most of the jobs meant that he'd have to go to a different area and give me some space. He'd always find a way back to appear beside me and scare me. I hate being scared, and he laughed it off every time. I was more than comfortable at this point, and nervousness had settled in the pit of my stomach. At the end of the night after we'd be sent home and come back the next day, he decided to walk me out. We'd walk back through the maze my workplace actually is, all the way to the employee custom center slash lockers. It was there that we had gotten our work costumes and stored our regular clothes in the lockers. Well, I was having trouble remembering the combination, and I couldn't find the little slip of paper that told me it. A creepy coworker came up to me and smirked at me seemingly waiting for me to finish up. I thought he had left by this point, so I wasn't expecting him to show up. After a few tries, he reached over and put the combination of the lock in for me. This was a serious red flag for me. He had already memorized my combination, and now I felt as though my privacy was completely gone. Again, I'm awkward and unsure what to do in any situation like this, so I thanked him, but suggested that he let me figure it out next time. I was hoping he would, so that he would forget my combination. Remember this for later. After changing back into my regular clothes in the girls' locker room, I came out, and he was still waiting for me. I had asked him why he had waited when he could have just gotten home sooner, to which he replied, Because I'm a gentleman, and a lady should be walked to her car, so she can be kept safe. I told him that my significant other was waiting to pick me up. He asked where, and I told him down the street, like an idiot. I still don't know why I complied with this creep as much as I did, but I'd never been in a situation like this one. He told me that it was too far for me to walk, and that it wasn't safe. So he offered to drive me over to my significant other's car, due to how tired I was and how much of an ache I had from the day. I just didn't have the strength to argue. I mean, he was creepy but nice. I chalked up the creepiness to him just being awkward. So without anything else weird happening, he took me to my significant others whom I had been texting the entire time, just to let him know where I was and what was going on. I had a deep gut feeling that I should text him everything. I knew about the guy, so I did. When we pulled up, I immediately got out of the car and my boyfriend sat there leaning against the car with his arms crossed. He wasn't very happy about him giving me a ride, but nonetheless thanked the creepy coworker for getting me over to him safely. The coworker nodded, seeming to smirk at my boyfriend the whole time. This is when my boyfriend first got a bad feeling about the guy. So we got home and my boyfriend warned me about the guy. 
telling me he wasn't getting a good vibe from him, and that he was pretty creepy. It was not even three minutes after that that I got a text from the coworker. He started sending me songs and memes, and telling me things like, I really feel like you get me. Now, I was deeply concerned. What the hell did I get myself into? Why did I have to be so goddamn nice to people? The following day at work, I was on the last day of training, and I had a massive pain attack. I have a chronic illness, and the situation ended with none of my managers listening to me. When I told them that the pain didn't last long and comes and goes, they proceeded to rush me to the emergency room. A stretcher carried me through the work while I was crying and trying to hide my face. The customers were quick to take out their phones and film the whole thing. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. But what happens next is worse. I received about 20 texts from the creepy coworker, asking me about how I was. At this point, I was done. I just didn't respond. After a few more random memes, he started texting me that he was drunk and thinking about not going home to his wife. This was the first time he'd ever mentioned to me that he had a wife. I was dumbfounded. Why was he so concerned about me when he had someone he obviously loved enough to marry? I didn't respond. I went to bed. In the morning, I woke up to my boyfriend looking at my phone in anger. My heart sank, and I could only imagine what creepy coworker had sent now. My boyfriend showed me the only text I'd gotten since the night before. It was from his wife texting me from his phone. She wrote me a message explaining that creepy coworker had a problem getting attached to women. She warned me that I should stay away from him and then told her name, my name. It was after that she had explained my name was a thing for him. All of his exes had the same name. Now at this point my boyfriend was telling me not to go back to this job, that it wasn't worth it. But that's not me. I was going to let one creep ruin this opportunity for me. This job meant the world to me, and I never wanted to let it go. So I told him if this continues, I'd go to HR. But in all honesty, I didn't really want to go to HR. I was the new girl. I didn't want the first month of the job to be me fighting with a harassment case. Biting my nails the whole way, I went to work. Suddenly, creepy coworker wasn't hovering anymore. I thought this meant he had been embarrassed. I was pretty convinced I wasn't going to have a problem after that. Big mistake. On my lunch break, he made sure to go on his lunch early and come find me. His normally enthusiastic attitude was gone, replaced by what I felt like anger. I was scared. He came up to me to let me know that his wife was full of shit and just angry because he was divorcing her. At this point, I didn't want anything to do with him, so I kept quiet hoping that he'd take the hint. Nope. He told me that he had a gift for me and that he'd give it to me after the shift. Quickly walking away before I could respond. After my shift, I go outside the work area to the lockers. I'd wait an extra hour and a half, even taking a closing position from a coworker, just so that he'd go home before me. Well, my lock wasn't locked all the way, and I was now freaked out. I opened the locker to grab my bag and go, but I noticed it. A rolled up piece of drawing paper. I know what kind it was because I myself am an artist. Unrolling it, it was a naked girl. A naked girl that resembled my video game character on World of Warcraft. I had briefly mentioned the whole WoW addiction to my group on the first day of training. I didn't even realize that he had heard any of that, much less memorized the information. Suddenly he walked up, even though he should be long gone by then, and he confronts me. He asked me if I like it, and because he seemed angry I said yes. I suggested he didn't do it anymore because my boyfriend wouldn't like this kind of gift at all. He rolled his eyes and playfully giggled at me, like I was joking with him. I wasn't. Not only did he follow me the whole way out of the workgrounds, he got on the employee shuttle that I got on to have witness. He sat right next to me leaning on me. I felt like a deer in the headlights, mentally begging someone to suggest that he shouldn't be that close to me. No one paid any attention. Instead, I spent the whole drive trying to get this man to pull his arm off my shoulder. I felt nauseated, and my head was spinning. 
After we got off, I practically dashed off the bus and ran to my boyfriend, who parked the car at the entrance to the employee parking zone. I got in the car and told him to go, and he took off and I started crying. I told my boyfriend and he was pissed. He wanted to turn around and punch the creepy coworker, but I talked him out of it through tears. I promised that I'd talk to my managers after that. Well, I kept looking for the right time to pull a manager aside, but never got a chance the next night. I went in. Now, creepy coworker's attitude did another 180, and he was being extremely weirdly playful. Then he crossed the final line. He grabbed my butt where customers could easily see him. My coworkers kind of laughed and thought it was a game, because this time I was pissed, and I pushed to my limit. I went after him. I legitimately punched him in the ass and shouted in his face. How do you like that, huh? Seething. He seemed unfazed by my anger. Instead, he laughed it off and winked at me. I went down into the basement for the employee bathroom and quickly threw up the contents of my stomach. I cried in the stall and prayed to God that this would stop. I quickly made an excuse, used my chronic illness and went home. So fast forward a few weeks. He had completely swapped out of his shift, so he wouldn't work with me. I felt like I had won the battle. I sent him a message and he realized he'd crossed boundaries. Until the night before Christmas Eve. I had a terrible feeling as my boyfriend was driving me to work that night. I mean, I felt gross. I got to work and he was there flirting with other girls. Suddenly having this big ego I'd never seen him display before. Like I said, when I knew him, he was very shy and awkward. It's like his personality flipped every time I had to see him. I never knew what side of CC I was going to get. That night, he actually stormed off as if all the other co-workers, including myself, closed the joint. We were scrubbing like normal, and he didn't seem all together. So we clocked out early, and I relaxed. I figured he'd gotten into trouble since one of our four managers seemed to be upset that he clocked out without permission. I was there extra late. The evening's festivities were done for the night, and my zone was pretty much closed off from customers. So I walked through the massive property that my work is to get to the street. I started taking new ways to meet my boyfriend, who picked me up, just so I couldn't be followed. This time I was going to walk straight out of the grounds and onto the street where the bus stops, where my boyfriend would be waiting at the curb I was about halfway through the approximately 12 minute walk, and I was in the dark area. Out of nowhere, I'm sure you've already guessed, creepy coworker shows up. He starts yelling my name and following me from behind. I pretend not to notice and walk faster. He yells my name again and seems angrier, so I sprint for it. I sprint all the way across the shuttle zone and end up crashing into someone's chest. Thank God it was actually my boyfriend, who had a really bad feeling and wanted to be as close to the work exit as possible. I looked back and creepy co-worker got on the shuttle, but was staring from the window smiling like a Cheshire cat the whole time. Never in my life had I been so terrified. After the next night was Christmas Eve and I was supposed to work, but I just knew if I went in something bad was going to happen to me. So crying the whole time because I knew I had to earn a bunch of points for calling out to avoid him. I cried asking the lady on the phone if I was going to get fired. And she said honestly she couldn't say. I respected that. But I knew I wasn't done. I wasn't going to let this fucking creep make me lose my job. I just worked so hard to get. Even changing my appearance to fit their strict standards. No. So I wrote the only person I could think of, my trainer, Christy. She was the lead and she is the kindest girl you've ever met. A heart of gold. You just knew being her friend meant that you'd have a trusted, confident for life. I told her everything. And I sent her the screenshots of the text he sent to me. I finally told someone with an ounce of leadership that I was scared to go to work. Immediately she responded and asked if she could tell the managers. And even though I was incredibly nervous, I told her yes. The next day I pulled in and God bless my ex-manager Christopher, because he was shocked at everything that had happened to me, and quickly helped me to write a report for HR. He led me through the steps. 
and even changed the schedule so I wouldn't work for the creepy coworker, unless he was specifically trading shifts. Two months go by. I'm well acquainted with the responsibilities of my work at this point. I'm comfortable, but of course there's no stopping a stalker. He had traded a shift and was working the night shift with me. He was angry every time he looked at me, and I avoided him at all cost. Then, around half the way through my shift, I'm down in the basement coming back from the restroom. I'm walking up the steps that lead back to my work area, and then I feel someone behind me. Before I could think a clear thought, I was pushed against the wall, hand beside my head. He leans in and says, you should smile more. Then the bastard chuckles and walks away. I feel pretty hysterical at that point and run to the closest lead, crying and trying to explain what had happened. It was at this point that my manager Christopher, pissed off that HR is taking so long to investigate my case, went to them and sped it up. Well, after four months of an interview process with HR, finally the case was resolved. Not only was he let go, but I was doing really well in my job finally. Nothing to worry me into not paying attention to my duties. Creepy coworker had left me alone ever since. But sometimes I get random friend requests from guys with no pictures and always similar names. Always close to his name. Creepy coworker, leave me alone. Or you won't like the results. I won't be intimidated ever again. And I will win every battle you throw at me. Let's not meet ever again again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links down below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, hashtag free chills.